Um, I think that I'll start, and if people join, they will join, because my intro is not the core of the talk. Um, I want to first thank you for joining me today. I know it's uh, hard to choose between talks with the same title at any conference, AI, blah, 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 identity, blah, blah, security, blah, blah, blah. So I'm happy that you choose me. Myself was in a same talk three weeks ago, and all the talk was about the fear of AI, like we all want to do. All the talk was like slides like this one, Warren GPT, they can hack you, they can fake password, they can fake passkeys. And I personally don't like all this fear from AI and Gen AI because at the end it's just tons of unstructured data that try to tell a story that is similar to what real people are telling. And with this misconception about the future and combining human and technology, I want to also talk about cyborgs. We all know cyborgs, a uh, being that is combining human and technology, physically or mentally. And we all like to imagine cyborgs as something really strong, something that can change the humanity, that can maybe contribute, maybe be an evil. But the truth is that cyborgs look like that, right? We are all kind of cyborgs. We're starting our day, search something on ChatGPT, getting bad answers, going to cloud, then trying to convert code in Copilot, right? And then try to kill myself and get back to ChatGPT to get the answers. We are getting to a phase where are we having a big trust on GPTs and Gen AI? And we ourselves being cyborgs, but let me tell you a story. A couple of weeks ago, unfortunately, I'm a very good JavaScript developer. I'm not proud of it, but it is what it is. It's facts. And I had this Python code that I had to convert to a JavaScript code. And instead of doing it myself with the knowledge that I have, of course, I went to ChatGPT and tell them, hey, can you convert this code, please? And immediately, yeah, of course, this is the code that you need to run. Of course, it didn't work, but I still haven't got a trust on myself. I still try to trust the machine. I asked again and get another version of bad code. And after 10 tries, I went to Copilot and asked them to do that, but I would got a bug again and again. I got frustrated, super fatigued, and then I just get to get some coffee. And when I was at the kitchen, I understand the whole code how it should look like. I just get back to the computer and write it, even without to look at this code. So maybe this is how cyborgs looks like, right? And it also has another form of uh, power that we give to people who are not technology. This, um, this subreddit is one that I really love. People that has nothing with technology, nothing with development, just went there and share how they just investigate the way they can hack prompts, right? So we have fatigued technology people, and we also have people who now feel like hackers. Today, I'm going to bring my knowledge to talk about how the identity security world affected by generative AI and GPTs. My name is Gabriel, and uh, I have an extensive background as developer, but somehow it always wa was beside security or identity. Today I'm doing developer relation in Permit.io. This is a startup around um, application authorization. And uh, for the last couple of months, I got a chance to work in multiple demos that uh, conclude Gen AI and AI together with that. I haven't mentioned it here, but I'm one of the maintainers of a project called OPAL, Open Policy Administration Layer, not OPA, similar. Um, and we'll get to that because it also has something to contribute, but this talk is going to be full with open source tools. If you see a picture and uh, you'll get the deck later, I already uploaded it to Shed, so don't be afraid if you find a tool and not remember that 30 minutes later, just get a deck and get back the tool that I discussed about. So I think there is four questions that we need to re-ask ourselves when we are um, using identity security or when, when we are worried about identity security in the era of Gen AI. Who, what, where, and when. The first question is who they are. We have new kind of identities. These identities are not a human, not a machine, something in the middle. And we need to ask ourselves again the question of who when it gets to identity security, authentication, and authorization. 
For long years, there was a very clear border. How do we behave with identities, with digital identities? For human, we had passwords, we have challenges, we have tokens, we have a very short spanning of sessions. And for machines, we have secrets, we have secret manager. Also for the vulnerabilities. So vulnerabilities with human was mostly social, phishing, right? Stuff like uh, stealing password because people do not keep them or make them very weak. And in machine, it was a misconfiguration of storing secrets, etc. So the border was very clear. If I'm a developer or a tech guy that trying to secure digital identity of a human, I'm doing one thing. But if I'm doing machine, I'm doing a different thing. But we already have new kind of identities in our software that runs everywhere. This is an example, I'll not say the name, but probably you all know that, of a new identity that actually we don't know in our identity access management system, right? Grammarly is an identity that evolved in our application, evolved in our data, reading our private data, installed by the end user, and still act with no form of machine authentication or machine authorization, right? So this kind of identity is an example of how machines getting uh, into sort of identity that need to have some protection the same as we do with human identity. On the other hand, we are getting capabilities of machine into humans. This is an example of some uh, medical bots. It's actually a friend sent me that. This friend is have nothing with technology. I mean, he has an iPhone. He knows how to open terminal, but he's not working as a developer or something. But he's really like the subreddit that I showed you. And every time you see this new cool medical bot that can help you with your health, he always going to this thread and to this subreddit and trying to hack it. And here you can see that they just answer him, hey, this is what I can run on your database, right? So we see here a human identity. They get a power of the machine. So here we do not have any protection on the machine digital identity for this human that trying to perform these operations. So the border between uh, human and machine identity is getting blurred and we need to make sure that we are securing our software in a way to deal with this new uh, form of identity. For years, we know this. We knew this three question as the question of authentication, right? To authenticate someone, to verify identity of someone, we need to know one of three questions: something you know, something you have, something you are. And then we got into multi-factor authentication. We want to ask two of these three questions. The problem is that today it's not what you know; it could be what the AI know, right? We see that. Uh, um, we see that implementation of Gen AI that can brutal force passwords super fast. And it's n nothing private, right? Again, I, I promise to do not get you fear of AI, but if you just search on Google tools to do brute force on very famous website, you'll just find tools that you can run locally and do that, right? So we need to re-ask this question of how we are verifying users. And I think the right or the proper answer for this question is moving from verification to ranking. Instead of verify identity by these three questions, we need to use them. We need to make them stronger. We need to make sure that we are using multi-factor authentication, maybe even multi-dimensional authentication using pass keys, etc. But we also need to start a ranking system in our system, in our applications, to combine authentication and authorization. So instead of one verification of who is a user and then just do authorization decision of allow and deny, we need to work together, authentication and authorization, and always rank the type of the request and the type of the operation that we are allowing. How we do this ranking? So luckily there, are, there is a lot of tools, some of them often open source tools. This, this rank I talk from a tool called ArcJet that aim to bring uh, security for developers. And they provide you a ranking between 0 to 100 of a bot that's trying to use the application. 
Zero is something that, of course, they can't analyze. One is a very dangerous bot, means a bot that's trying to pretend they are not a bot. And 100 is a bot that, like, CRL call, right? And instead of just making an identity, hey, this is a bot, a bot or not a bot, and we are not allowing a bot, and we are using some tools to not allow bot, we need to be smart because sometimes we want to give bot access, right? We want to, if this is a good bot, if some, some user trying to run CRL or some other automated script, maybe we don't care. But we need more factors to do this ranking. What are the other factors that we can calculate is um, usually we speak about uh, types of based access control, like role-based access control, but I like here to take it from the more intuitive perspective, because this is how Gen AI work, right? We are going into intuitive security. So let's talk about three types of ranking that we can have to have better authentication and better question of who our users are. So first is an ownership. If a user has an ownership of data, we want some time to give them access also to the bots that identify with their users. The second is relationship. Relationship-based access control is a very powerful term that came lately in terms of identity security. We'll understand soon what it do, but relationship, the nice thing with relationship is that we can get ranking of ownership. We can say, okay, if you have direct ownership on a resource, I let you do something with a bot level 90, but if you have uh, uh, non-direct ownership of a resource, I let you do operation only with both in a level 50 or the vice versa. Uh, yeah, the opposite way. Another way is, of course, condition. We can allow people to do stuff in particular time of days. We can allow people to do stuff if, the, if it is a bot, but the IP is IP of a real person, we might allow a request. But if it is a bot, even a safe one, that's trying to make a call from VPN or something, we might want to block it. How does that work visually? So assuming we have a forest, ownership is the most simple one, right? We can have like access control list, users are owners of data, and we can have this ownership as another ranking when we are doing this verification of user or who are the users. Then there is the relationship that try to simplify it. So here what we can see, the user that is a botanist has only direct access, direct ownership of one tree, but because this tree, uh, the year of this tree is 2014, they can also get a botanist access to another tree. And then we can have a smart ranking on the ownership of what these users can do. If you can see the, the logger has access to all the pine trees, because they are related to each other, but not uh, um, to other trees that are not pines, right? So we can have this ranking system to create better auth experiences for the user or ask better the question of who they are. We can also use conditions. Conditions could be plain, could be based on policy as code with languages like Rigo or Cedar or whatever policy language you choose, there are too much of them out there, and we can uh, just write conditions, and this condition can also have a factor of ranking on our software. We can also combine this all ranking method or ranking dimensions to create much more smarter enforcement. With all that, we can have a ranking that is combined from how bot is this user and how dangerous the operation that they are trying to do. And that allow us ask a very better question of who they are, because it is not now a question of true or false, a question of one verification or two verification, is a question of multidimensional ranking. An example of architecture that can work like that, so here we can see a user that is using an application, and this application using the ArcJet agent for bot ranking, then they are going with Opal. Opal is a tool to manage a policy system across application authorization. It builds off a server and an engine. The server itself is having all the configuration of the policy, like the condition that we want, what we want to allow or not allow to users, and then we can connect the client which is the policy engine itself, to more resources. So we can, for example, connect it to a product that do risk scoring or connect it to a graph database that store the relationship between our resources. This kind of architecture can help us having a stronger system to bring better answers to the question of 
who they are. We also want to streamline maybe the way that we are enforcing that. We, uh, that's an example of how this Opal um, check function work, and then we can streamline a check function that include also authentication factors into the question of ranking that we want to do every time we are asking this question. So how do we rethink of the who question? So first, we are always challenging. Never assume, never sessions that are just live. We are always trying to try to challenge the session, ch challenge the authentication authorization. We are using ranking over verification to make much more uh, clear view of what is the actual thing that I, I know about this user or not. We are accepting this blurred border. We are not saying we are blocking bots or we are ex accepting bots. We are accepting that there is new kind of identity in our software and that we need to find a secure way to uh, make it work. And we are on incorporating authorization and authentication together. We are not already anymore bordering a line. Authentication is verification. Authorization is uh, um, asking a question of permissions, they, are, they should incorporate together into a strong system that rank the user and track what we are allowing and not allowing them to do. The next question is what they can do, right? This is much more authorization question. We want to ask what a Gen AI agent or software in, in our software can do with our software, and why is that so important question? So for years, the way that authorization or permission questions work in our application is on one way. We always try to authorize the inbound, and the more we get into our internal software, into our services, then we have a less worry about permissions, right? So I have this API gateway, and I am authorizing requests that getting into this API gateway. Then I have some enforcement of calls between my internal services, but the problem is now we have agents in our application that can perform operation that we haven't expect, right? So if I'm writing a new microservice and I'm writing a code there that's trying to do something, I can write authorization or authorization check before I'm doing this uh, call. But if I'm just implementing a kind of AI agent in my application, they can do everything. They can do unexpected thing. So we need to find a way to authorize in an efficient way our internal traffic. And this is where a new type of tools getting into the picture. A tool that I like is an open source tool. It's called Lunar Dev. Lunar Dev is an API gateway, but for the other side. Instead of an API gateway for inbound, for ingress, this is an egress. Every, this, every, to, every call that we are sending outside or internal our system is getting this like proxy server, and then we can implement authorization in this server itself. So we can connect this server into authorization service that get all the data in a real time from our policy and from our data. And all our API calls, all our internal API calls or API calls to external services now pass via this egress API uh, gateway. And that help us actually to make much smarter and safer a implementation of AI agents inside our application. Another viewpoint of this AI agent that run in our application, and we want to ask the question of what they can do, is some form of proactive uh, requirement, right? So this AI agent can run, and, so, and they can understand that they need some more permissions, right? So they run, they run as a result of an operation of a user, and then they understand that if they have access to some table in the database or to some more columns in the database, they will get more access. So I think it's a good time to move uh, into proactive access control. So for years, in the beginning of the computing day, we use mandatory access control, right? We do not have any some form of permission in our application. Everything was decided by the developers themselves. And then we moved to discretionary access control. This is what we have mostly today. So we are allowing our users to define their permissions. But what I think is that we need to move to an era of proactive access control, access control that is open APIs for new tool to get access, to request access for new resources. And that's the only way we can implement AI agent in our application that can also be smart. So if they, for example, read a database and they find that they have a limitation of read the whole columns, they can ask, for example, somehow we need 
still to discuss the standards and implement them, but they need to find a way to ask, hey, I need now access to more columns in the database to perform a query or to perform a job, and you can't even just block to me after, right? But we need to uh, think on access control in a more proactive ways, on a users that can understand our permissions model and ask for more and more permissions. So the question of what? We need first to think of egress the same as ingress. We can't trust, if we are implementing, of course, AI agent in our application, we can't trust that all the traffic and all the permissions in our application are driven by what happened in the inbound call. We need to make sure that we are actually streamlining the permissions between the inbound and the outbound call, because they can do, again, things that we don't know. We want also to decentralize the way that we are enforcing permissions. That way we can put it one agent or one engine in the outbound, one engine in the inbound, and we can have one model of permissions and try to start think proactive. The next question, and I think this is one of the most um, discussed question in the world of Gen AI, is where they can get. We have now AI agent and probably in the internet, they can get everything, right? This is a, um, from a couple of months ago from The Verge, uh, an article about the way that many even very common and famous uh, AI companies that try to train models, they are ignore the robot.txt file in website. Robot.txt, if you're not familiar with that, is a file that you put in your root folder of your website, and it says to search engine if they should search in this website or not. This is good because we want to keep our data private, even if this application is not private, right? But many models that train themselves on the internet just ignore that and access website that has robot text, right? So we need to ask ourselves again, what is the where? Because usually when we are thinking about machine and human, we have this like blacklist that we are, or whitelist that we are allowed them. But here it has much, um, much flexibility on where AI agent can get. The best way to deal with that is first, again, education. AI is not a black box, it's not a black magic. Sorry for me reusing memes. It's not a black magic, it's a, it's a thing that you need to learn, not that complex, I can promise you. When I started to look on AI back in 2015, it was, I mean, I didn't understand anything. Today, with like three hours, and again, I'm a JavaScript developer, not a good developer, I can in like get a huge model that's running on my local computer, give you an answer for anything that you ask. So educate your people about how AI chains work, how things work, how they should implement them in a way that keeps secure. That's the best way they will not get to where they're not supposed to get. The other option for that, and a tool that became very popular in the last couple of months, years, for me, last couple of months, but it's there here, is what we call RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. Retrieval Augmented re Generation is not really a tool, but is more like a method. The method of RAG is building a pipeline that can have the augmented data to the LLM, to the model that answer your questions, based on authorized data. The simplest way that a RAG works, we can see the diagram here. So you are asking a question, you are asking this question LLM, but a lang chain application or chain application knows also to search this question in a database that we can authorize the data, that you can know that the data is real, that you can know that the data is up to date, and then the result that the LLM returned to you, the Gen AI engine or the language, lang large language model returned to you, it has a way to augment if it's a real data or just nonsense. The most common example of how to use LLMs, if you want to make sure that your data that the LLM return is real, you can put an LLM, you can, for example, put all the Wikipedia in a vector DB, and for every question that you ask the large language model, they also run it in Wikipedia and make sure that the results are true. Not that Wikipedia is true, but at least it's something that can help us to make sure we are getting true question. The same, and I know it's kind of complex diagram, so sorry about that, AI yeah, is complex. Um, the same we can do with RAGS is using authorization services to authorize requests. I'll try to go step by step here. So we have a user. This user is asking a question via a link chain application. And this link chain application is asking uh, 
d database authorization gateway. So for example, we have a vector DB with all our internal documents. And in this vector, we have an authorization service that can authorize the document in, in this database. Here I also use the Opal architecture to get the authorization decision, but here I'm not asking for check. I'm asking for filtering. Do you remember the relationship-based access control? That could be really helpful here because I can ask the GraphDB, hey, this user now asks a question for the LLM, search this question in the vector DB or in semantic search instance and return me only the document that they are authorized to. And then I can tell, the, to tell to the model, hey, this is the document that the user is authorized to. If the answer is based on documents that are not in this list, they shouldn't get an answer from it, right? And then we kind of separate the concern because the LLM engine can still get where they can get to get the model. We can inspect where we are training it. We can inspect where we are getting it from because sometimes, or for most use cases, you're probably get your uh, um, LLM engine from somewhere, someone else, right? We are not, or maybe I'm just false thinking, but I think that most of us do not um, train our models from the scratch anymore. So we can make sure that the model is trained himself on data that we know, but we can also make sure that they do not access or do not return answer that they're not supposed to. So to answer the question of where, or to re-ask that, we need first to educate. The most important question, I think, about AI or about uh, where our models get trained from is understanding how do we uh, get this data? How do we train them? How do we return the data to the user? So education is first. Of course, using RAGs is very powerful for security. By the way, not only for authorization, could be also for performance, could be for other security cases, for scoring of questions, etc. So RAG is a very powerful tool to create security among lang large language models that we want to implement internally. And we, we want also always monitor. RAG is also help us to monitor because we know every question that came and we can run another Gen, Gen AI on it that inspect if the question has some vulnerabilities, etc. cetera. Um, and we all wanna manage the authorization of this question when they come to the LLM. So we answered the, or re, we re-ask and thought about the where question, and now the last question is when. When is a very important question because it's a question that do not ask often in authorization. We have this uh, misconception that this is a solved problem. What happened with the user on the timeline is kind of solved problem. So in the beginning, there was session-based authentication, right? So the way that we authenticate or verify users was based on session. We start a session by verification or something, and then we have a time for a session, and then we disconnect that. And all the way of the session, we try to authorize stuff based on the session data. But session is very pro problematic and not secure, and then we move to token-based authentication. We'll not get in details why session is not secure and token is secure, but token is also lose its data, it lose its like honor as the secure way of authentication because Gen AI, for example, can track tokens or can fake tokens or can create fake validations very fast, right? So we don't want tokens that live for 60 seconds because that return us to a centralized server that revalidate tokens, but we wanna make sure that we have something between token-based authentication that it's self-validated and we can revoke it actively, and also that has some form of session. So what we want to do, this is an example of how a bad actor can evolve in a token even without knowing about the sessions, right? And that's actually a term of Gen AI because that's the only possibility to get the um, fast pace that we want to do this uh, involvement in tokens. I think the way that we need to start on uh, sessions and tokens is more like peak and valleys, like the heart rate monitor. It's not a straight line anymore. It's not only a session 
are not only a token, is a way that we always monitor. We need to manage our session in some form of event-driven mechanism. And if you want to read more about it, there are some working group in the identity field, one of them called CAPE. CAPE is for Continuous Access Evaluation Profile. And this is actually a method that helps manage event-driven security, uh, identity security. With using event-driven, we can always track that we do not get any vulnerability that are a result of uh, things that we haven't measured before because Gen AI is fast. Here is an example of how can we use uh, tools like Open Features and, and Optoggle to create an event-driven mechanism on sessions of a user. So here we can see a user in application. A user is authenticated to the application, is authorized to the application, and then we can connect a tool called Octo Optoggles. Optoggles is a tool that knows how to connect to policy engines and track for data changes. Every time that the data is changed, it knows to work with multiple, um, multiple protocols of, of feature flagging or feature toggling, and then we can get a real-time updates of what a user is see or what a user is experiencing in the application. Using up toggles and open features, can, open feature or any other feature toggling uh, solution can create us application experience that is continuous. That is, if something changed in the policy engine, if, for example, the risk score if I, of a user is changed, or if, for example, an IP of a user is changed without us want that to change, then we actually want to revoke or create a new experience for these users. For these users. So this is an example of architecture that can help you implement continuous experience for your user. So to answer the question of when, first we need to start to think about continuous security also for identity, not like its session, its token, its revalidation, its revoke. We need to think about the whole event-driven timeline or lifespan that we have for users. Uh, again, I like to say that peak and valleys over a straight line. Straight line means someone is... But peak and valleys mean there is something in the session, there is something in the user. Um, I'll mention a good program. No, I think I can. Thank you. We answer all the questions. That's uh, tons of data. As I said, I haven't went in details into the, each of the configuration that, uh, the, of the diagrams that I have, but the deck is there. You can find the tools. You can try something new and re-ask yourself these four questions. Thank you.